Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Community Works. I'm Bernadette Welsh, your host. Each one of our shows highlights a local nonprofit agency in our community. Our goal is to educate you, our viewers, about the great work that's going on all around us every day by local agencies and their supporters. When people help their neighbors, everybody benefits. The focus of today's show is the work of an organization called Swords to Plowshares. It's from the Bible, and it's all about changing metal from one form to another. And I am so pleased that I have two wonderful guests here today that are going to explain to us what Swords to Plowshares is all about. So please welcome Reverend Jim Curry, the co-founder of the organization, and you are a chief blacksmith type I'm person. I'm the chief blacksmith. Excellent. And also Pina Volano, who is the co-chair of the organization, a professor of nursing, and you're gonna and you help the organization with community outreach and all kinds of good things. So Pina, welcome to the show. Thank welcome you. both of you. Thank you. Thank you. All righty. So Jim, I'd like to start with you if you could explain to our viewers the mission and a little bit of the history of Swords to Plowshares. Well, I'm gonna go back to what you said about changing metal into one form, from one form into another. That comes from the uh, prophet Isaiah, where he talks about, they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not raise up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Well, swords, well, for us, guns are swords. And what we wanna do is be part of that biblical process of transforming guns, which could be of potential great harm in our community, into tools of nurture and of hope, gardening tools. And we work from the uh, taking the guns that uh, Pina will talk about how we get them through gun buybacks, through destruction, through transformation, and then making sure they get to the gardens where people can be using them to grow food and to create beautiful spaces for our community. And could you tell us a little bit about the history? When did you all get started? Mm -hmm. Pina and I found ourselves at the same table at the police chief in uh, New, New Haven. Haven. Uh, they had been doing buybacks for a long, long time. And I had made a connection with folk who were doing this transformation of guns that were brought into police departments, destroyed and then transformed. And we started talking at that table and all of a sudden we had the idea that this is gonna go further than uh, where people thought we were gonna go. And uh, that was in 2017, 16, 16. 16 17. Yeah. Um, and we've been working ever since, growing and expanding our outreach. And you're based in New Haven, are you? We're based in New Haven in and Hamden. Hamden. Okay, yeah. New Haven um, and Hamden. Uh, our forge actually is at Grace and St. John's Church, Episcopal Church in uh, Hamden. Hamden. Um, our official uh, address is still in New Haven. Okay, very good. All right, so now, um, what kind of roles do you play? Could you expand on that? Pino, I'm gonna start with you. What exactly do you do in the organization? All the things that you do? Yeah, so I'm actually one of the co-founders as well as uh, Reverend uh, Curry said, or Bishop Curry, I should say, um, said. I, I'm pretty much the liaison with the police departments and the community outreach um, person who really connects us with the police departments to organize the gun buybacks, get mm -hmm. volunteers to actually work at the buybacks. Um, and do research at the buybacks. So uh, one of my different hats that I wear being a professor of nursing and research, we always wanna evaluate what we're doing and does it make a difference in the community? And um, we also wanna learn about where do these guns come from? Why, why are people turning them in? What motivates them to turn them in? And just really get a history of like what their storage practices are stories that people tell us are absolutely amazing. We hear things that the firearm that they've turned in was um, used um, uh, in a suicide, uh, or that um, someone in their home was actually killed by a firearm. And so um, 
or that somebody has died and now they're left with all these firearms. And those are the things that we want this, gun, the gun buybacks, we view them as a safe venue for people to turn in firearms safely and um, to do it with getting something back in return and feeling good about themselves. Mm -hmm. So it can save them from getting into hands of a child. It can save them from someone who has mental health issues, yes. dementia, then we don't tend to think of those or a veteran yes. that may be distraught. And then even um, when people surf the, the internet for obituaries and someone that has an intent to do some harm and crime, that they can steal from those homes that have a gun in, in the house. Excellent, so your role is quite broad and yeah. very, very, very important. So thank so. you. Now, we're calling you Reverend Jim, and we want to tell a little, us a little bit about your background. We Obviously, we've quoted from the Bible because that's where your name is from. So mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about you. I'm a retired bishop in the Episcopal Church. I uh, served here in Connecticut uh, for 35, six years. Um, and uh, although we were living in the uh, Hartford area most of that time, uh, we retired to New Haven. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the things that Pina was not telling about herself is the, the kind of outreach she has with people in her kinds of positions at other institutions. Um, mm -hmm. And so one of the things that has been true about Swords to Plowshares is that we start locally, but network mm -hmm. first uh, mm -hmm. regionally, then statewide, uh, part of our name is and Northeast. Nationally. And now nationally. And now nationally, because it are says national. Northeast on your wonderful site. We are sweater. working Correct. nationally. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about our we, process. Yeah, in, we don't want to get in, ahead of ourselves in, too in much. In just a moment. But as a priest and then as a bishop, uh, I was very much aware of uh, the harm that uh, guns, firearms, can have, can have in, yes. uh, in families mm -hmm. and in neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. One of the most important parts of my learning was after Sandy Hook, and I had been one of the officiants at a, a boy's funeral at Sandy Hook, um, was that the people who were working in the cities were feeling that their loss wasn't counted as much as the loss of the children in. That's an interesting point. It's mm -hmm. an interesting point. We make judgments about what happens in the inner cities versus right. what happens in our suburbs or you know where, right. where mm -hmm. wealthier people live. Right. right. Okay. So um, I had been at a meeting. It was actually when Vice President Biden came to Western Connecticut uh, State University right after Sandy Hook and I was sitting next to two people who didn't know each other. One was a father from Sandy Hook, and one was a father from Hartford. And within that time, they realized that their tears were the same. Yeah. And mm -hmm. part of our work is to continue to keep the balance of focus on the tragedies that happen in the inner every cities day. every day. That's right and uh, in issues of suicide, mm -hmm. issues of uh, injury prevention, kids getting guns, um, but also just the, the very nature that guns not carefully stored, yeah, we're not legally stored, guns that aren't separated from ammunition are going to be um, potential instruments mm -hmm. of great harm. Of great harm, and, for sure. And I do want to just add one thing here is that we're not about taking guns away. I want no, to be very gonna, we, uh, we're going to be, be really clear that cuz I always um, one of the things that I always like to share is that I am a legal gun owner. Yeah, my husband's a legal and, gun owner. And so um, it's not about that. It's about being a responsible gun owner, it's about storing them. And then from my background, I am a registered nurse and I've worked in the ER, I've worked in the ICU and worked in trauma, and I've seen firsthand the devastations that gun violence has caused, both Sandy Hook type um, gun violence and as well as everyday urban gun violence. Every day. And then and the tragedies and senseless loss of life. And um, it's, it's tiring, it's, um, it, it affects us as well as healthcare providers. 
And I don't think yeah, people appreciate think that, that you see that death day in and day out, and it's just another senseless life lost. And so that's why I got involved, and it's just really to stop and say, we've got to be a part of the solution and not a part of the problem. Right, because Jim and I, before the show, were talking yeah. about what can we do. That's right. And that's what we're, why we're doing the show. Right. We're doing the show because we're trying to give you, our viewers, and anyone who yeah. listens to this program, some ideas mm -hmm. about how we can deal with this serious issue in our community. Um, I, I can't say enough about that. So we've been talking about and around the four pillars mm -hmm. of your organization, mm -hmm. Swords to Plowshares. Right. But now let's go through and let's, let's do it one step mm -hmm. at a time okay. rather than we've been mm -hmm. talking around it. So Pina, explain to the community how you actually do a gun buyback. What happens? So we obviously meet with the police. We do not handle the guns ourselves. We work very close with law enforcement. Um, we set up a date. We uh, set up a time that it's going to happen, and um, the police organize the staffing um, for that. Uh, guns come in. We um, exchange them for cash in our area. We prefer to do that as, as opposed to gift cards. I know there's a lot of controversy. Do people go back out and buy other guns? We have not found that with our right. no, with our buybacks at all. That? And in fact, we actually have found people that donate the money back to our program and or buy our, our tools because they believe in the work that we do. And we will always have uh, a demonstration at our gun buyback so they can actually see the transformation. They can step out of their cars, actually take part in, in uh, hammering at the anvil and um, feel that transformation. And if you can see the cathartic effect that it has on individuals that have been affected by some type of gun violence, I mean, the emotions that come through it is incredible and, it, and it's indescribable unless you see it for yourself oh. firsthand. But after the guns come in, right. they're vetted, they're um, taken in, serial numbers if there are any there, um, and exchange of, of uh, cash that like we have a certain uh, tier of different type of quality and quantity of guns that you bring okay. in. Does it get sorted by the kinds of metals or it doesn't matter? No, it's, it it's it the matter? type of guns, whether it's a handgun, a rifle, an assault weapon, we will um, pay um, more. There will be an exchange more for that. Okay. Um, and and we only pay for operating guns that are operation. I mean, now that actually work. People tend to think that, oh, you know, they're all guns that don't work. They're old. They're oh, antiques. Oh, yes. Right. We and do, it doesn't really matter, right? For us, is the gun that that can harm anybody and we get that question all the time is did you get the right gun in and well what's the wrong gun yeah and that's the question we'd argue is that mm -hmm. any gun that works can hurt somebody and get into the wrong hands for sure so once they're vetted then um they go through a process of being destroyed and jim and i will actually be the ones to cut them up and more so jim and then um they're actually uh, Take the, those parts are taken and then transformed into um, to something different. So that's where the blacksmith part right. comes in. But Almost. At, yes, Almost. But, but at the buyback, the other thing that we do is survey the people that come in voluntarily. We don't require it, but we talk to them and ask data about, are they a veteran? Where did they get the firearm from? What was the reason why they turned it in? How far they traveled to turn it in? On average, we have people that travel over 20 miles to bring in a firearm. So to me, the motivation to come in is... It's uh, important data. It's very important data. And so we can tell you that about 13% of people that turn in firearms at the buybacks that we host have um, some type of mental health issue and want that gun out of the home for that reason. So to us, we're preventing injuries. It's yeah. it's it's injury prevention at its best. At its best. Right, and so people argue gun buybacks don't work. Well, I'll argue that, where's your data? We can tell you our data is here that it is a venue, safe venue for people to bring them in to help get those guns out of the homes that people cannot secure them for whatever reason. For whatever reason, right. And most of them yeah, are. We do find that. that about 50% of them are inherited. And to yes, us, yes. and to us, I think that is a critical piece we miss. You know, we, we think about, oh, that their criminals are here and, and all that. But those to me are the most critical guns because they're usually people who don't have any history of how to work a firearm. And they sometimes don't know that they're there. So a widow will find them once they're cleaning out clothes and belongings to their loved one. And then all of a sudden there's a firearm and they're scared of it and they don't yeah, know what to do it. it and most times they are loaded. 
And so those are an accident waiting to happen, a grandchild that comes over and visits that can grab that. I so for us, it's invaluable work that I think that we do. And it also strengthens, I think, the community relations with the police department, with law enforcement. That is, I think, an understatement, especially in the climate where law enforcement is viewed yeah. negatively. And I don't think we appreciate as much that they do and from a safety perspective as well. And we've just seen a transformation in just so many other people, including the law enforcement, that see the value in, in the stories. Again, I go back to that. The stories are incredible that people tell you. Okay, okay, so we have to keep moving yeah, along. Yeah. We do have to keep moving along. Um, so we've explained the gun back program. So now we're gonna talk about how you get the get the guns, uh, Reverend Jim, and turn them into, you transform them into garden yeah. tools. At, so at, how does that happen? At the gun buybacks, the police take custody of the guns. Mm -hmm. Then we work with police departments, chiefs, uh, armor, armorers, uh, evidence room uh, personnel, mm -hmm. and we work out a time when we can come and together destroy those guns. Mm -hmm. And we destroy them according to ATF regulations so that they could never, ever be put back together. Mm -hmm. And we make sure that we're copying uh, the serial numbers. In a state like Connecticut, where we have wonderful state registration laws, mm -hmm. it's important to keep those numbers um, clear as things are being destroyed. Uh, yeah, so you, yeah. you know, you know which know, ones have been taken out. Yeah, that's right. Yes, yeah. I get that. So we'll destroy the guns. And then the police will basically hand the pieces of metal, which are no longer guns, they're pieces of metal. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll sign for them mm -hmm. and we'll take them to our forge. And we're going to start making uh, different tools. Yep, we have two kinds of tools here. Why don't you, that's the one yeah, lift up. I got this one I like. I like this one. This is a trowel that's made out of a shotgun barrel. And then we make the handles. handles. We have people who are... Okay, because uh, the wood is really nice too. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that one you can see is much more like a hammer handle. Yeah. Um, Although I think I could use that in the garden. garden I could absolutely. turn the there soil with that. It's a double-edged cultivator. Maybe I'll buy that one from you. <laughs> We'll get to that in just a couple minutes. Um, so we have all these pieces. We need to uh, sort of sort them. Right. Some pieces we t put to the side for having events where people can take small pieces of destroyed guns and make right them on. into plaques or make them oh. into pieces of art. Okay, or jewelry, right? Oh. Well, or jewelry. Uh, every, Every time we do a demonstration, we yeah. invite people to make jewelry with us. And anybody who comes yeah. can take a hammer and make a heart oh. from a ring from a shotgun barrel. Oh, we've worked with the uh, University of Massachusetts in Dartmouth where we've given them bigger pieces and they're making sculptures right now mm -hmm. for, I love that uh, idea. for an exhibition yeah. at the university uh, later this spring. Um, we cut the barrels into about seven inch slices and using traditional uh, techniques of blacksmithing. I mean, I, I, we're going back to uh, tools and uh, processes that are hundreds of years yeah, old. Yeah. Uh, we don't melt down the guns, we make them hot enough so that they can be molded. Oh, I see what you mean. You don't make hammers. them molten, you just make them hot enough and then you, they can and be the ma That's malleable right. and you can. That's right. Oh, I and get And you get mm -hmm. to feel yeah. the actual transformation as you're banging that mm -hmm. hammer on that gun. Um, so we have two different kinds. The rifle barrel has a lot more metal in it, so we're mm -hmm. able to make more uh, specific kinds of pieces here, here so here. Let me, let me no, this one this one this one yeah. oh this is one i like yeah. yeah so we make a little hole on one side we'll make a fork on the other side and a hole in the middle for the handle and um this takes uh, a new person about two and a half hours to make okay and then uh putting it with the handle and so on the tools that we make with the shotgun barrel, the the trowel, 
is a quicker process mm -hmm. um, because there's not that much metal there. We, right. we use out. a saw, cut it, and shape it. Cool. Um, okay. Again, I'm not being disrespectful, but boy, we got we, we got so much to talk about. All right, this is very important, Pina, because again, you alluded to the responsible gun owner, mm -hmm. and I really want our viewers to understand that we are not trying to say that the right to bear arms is something that mm -hmm. we are trying that your organization is trying to abolish. So please talk to us about responsible gun ownership. What does that entail? I know a little bit about it because my husband's a responsible gun owner, but I want our viewers to know about it. Yeah, so so to, as um, um, Bishop Curry said, to secure those firearms properly so they don't get into the hands of somebody who shouldn't have them. And as I mentioned, I am a responsible gun owner. They are not out where they shouldn't be and then people don't have access should to them. Should they have a safe? Should people have a safe Absolute, where they absolutely. can and at, a lock with a lot that's lockable? Yeah. Yes, and at every gun buyback program, one of the things that we do will always have a safe storage component to it and uh, remind people what the law is. Always hand out free gun locks. Mm -hmm. And when we do have funds, we do hand out gun safes. Excellent. So again, it's to... For the venue itself is for people who no longer need those guns, who can no longer store them properly. But we also know that people still have guns at home and we want those guns secured properly. And so again, like we said, we will always do uh, free gun locks that mm -hmm. are provided by the police department. And you and show folks how to do it? Absolutely. We demonstrate it for them and they can have as many as they want free. Mm -hmm. I love it. Yeah. Okay. And another component of the responsible gun owner is that that owner knows how to use that gun Fire. properly. That's right. So it's not just storage. That's right. It's, it's making sure that uh, they know how to use the gun and they know how to show other people um, that it's safely stored mm -hmm. and it's not to be used incorrectly. Right, and that the ammunition is in a different place Absolutely. than that the guns Absolutely. are. Or that it's all in the lockable safe and it, it's, right. it, it is safe. Right. Um, it's a critical part of what you're doing, it, is it not, Pina? It's Absolutely, a and, and part. again, I bring it back to my own roots of being a nurse yeah. and you know sharing the stories with them. And um, it's also to train our new uh, uh, student nurses, our student uh, medical uh, fellows that are uh, going through school to make this an important part of their curriculum. Absolutely. And so student nurses will always come with us. They, they come and we also have medical students that come and participate and actually do the surveys. And so we really give them community health nursing and public health nursing at its finest. At its finest. So, its finest. and that's experiential learning that you don't get in a book. No, and you don't get in the classroom. Get, how could you get it in a book? Right. I mean, when you're dealing with an organization that is dedicated mm -hmm. to teaching and to enlightening folks and mm -hmm. to hear stories that make sense to people that touch their hearts. Right. I think that that is, it says so much about your organization. Absolutely. And I'm glad that our viewers are learning about swords to plowshares. Okay, so we, I think we've also talked about, I don't think we need to talk about it again, you're collecting data, you're doing the mm -hmm. research. Is it published someplace? Is there a place where people can find yes. this information? Is They're that on peer your review. website? Yeah, and, and we actually should be putting them there, and we, I don't think we have, but um, they are in peer-reviewed um, journals. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we've done evidence-based reviews through the American College of Surgeons and um, the Eastern Association for the Surgery of Trauma. Excellent. Um, so they are not um, uh, Mickey Mouse journals, I'll say. They're, they are peer reviewed and scrutinized. Um, so, um, and I think that's the piece that we're trying to get out that, that we're trying to make these all evidence based and these yeah. um, programs work. It's not just emotions. No, no. And it's very hard to look at what, what's the measurement that you look at. Yeah. And so, um, you know, we've seen homicides drop. You know, when we first started doing gun buybacks in 2011, the homicide levels uh, uh, rates in New Haven were 35. 
we got them down to single digits. Yeah. And again, it's not just the buyback, but it's a one prong of it's a multi prong. It's, it's a education. multi pronged okay. approach. And yeah. I want to be really clear with that. The gun buybacks are not end all be all, but they open up conversations. They open up venues to bring in uh, opportunities so people feel safe bringing in their firearms and not be scared that they're going to get penalized. And these are all no questions asked. No questions asked, for sure. And so, and no punitive, um, you right. know, no, no, no punishment. No negative repercussions no, at, not all. at all. Folks, it's just about doing the right thing. If you feel that the gun might be a danger to yourself and mm -hmm. to others, bring mm -hmm. it back to the police station. And here's a wonderful organization that's going to do some good with it. Okay, let's look at some pictures, shall we? Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's look at some We can't spend a lot of time on the pictures, mm -hmm. but we want folks to actually see mm -hmm. What you folks doing? And here is a beautiful picture. Is that you? That's me. With a little and guy. With a little guy. He was, he was four at the time. And mm -hmm. we put the anvil on the ground so he didn't have to reach up Shifting. to it. Um, but he made that trowel um, and worked on it all that day. Um, in this case, I happened to take the trowel home with me, finished it up, and made a handle for him and took it, took it up to him. Wonderful. Um, and what are we looking at here? These are interns that we had last summer through a grant with the Episcopal Church in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. We were able to uh, hire uh, community members in Hamden and New Haven, Haven. Uh, teenagers, to come work for us. They learned the processes of blacksmithing. Right. Uh, they also used uh, uh, electrical saws and drills and other kinds of equipment, so they mm -hmm. were learning that too. And then they would also go and tell their story to uh, their friends, to their yeah. friends, but also to events that we had throughout the community through yeah. the summer. Wonderful. And here you are heating yeah. up some metal. Yep. Uh, we get it to red hot. Red and hot. And then get it over to the anvil and start pounding. Okay. And then I think we have one other picture. This is kind of your setup. This is kind of the setup. We use uh, a forge, which is propane uh, driven. Yes. driven yes. And that allows us, it's also self-contained. So uh, the safety of this uh, equipment is really quite high, especially compared to if we were at Sturbridge Village with the open coal Yeah, coal I saw yeah. that part, yeah. Yeah, for sure. So. Okay, great. So now we've given people a little bit of visual, because we're also very visual, right? Right. To see what uh, Reverend Jim and Pina's organization is doing. I, it's just great to see a child, to see teenagers working on this. It just touches my heart. I think it's wonderful. Okay, so we do know that gun buybacks are effective. You're allowing data to be collected. You're you're telling stories. So what, T Pina, how could it be less, more than excellently effective? Yeah, and I think the other piece too is we actually have politicians and legislators that come to our events. And we've had Senator Blumenthal come to many events, uh, Congresswoman uh, DeLauro, um, Mayor um, uh, Elliker, uh, Mayor Garrett in uh, Hamden, um, and uh, many other um, politicians very good, very yeah good. yeah and I think they can see it for, for sure. themselves so we are running out of time so I really wish we had more time to talk about this but I think we've touched on a lot of important points I don't think we've missed out on anything important no. except to go to the website so the website is a very important place it's um, s2p northeast.org there you see it right on the screen if you want to learn more about swords to plowshares you can go to that website. You can email Reverend Jim. He'll answer any questions that you might have about this wonderful transformation. And, and, and I thank you so much for sharing with our viewers all this, this process. I think it's just amazing. And um, thank you we'll talk about us. other things more time. I'm sure you have things planned for the future and all good things. But right now, we've got a good message that has gone out to the uh, community about what you do and how you save lives and how you give hope to people who might not have any hope. So uh, thank you, Reverend Jim and Pina, for being on the show. Thank you, everybody, for watching. I really appreciate it. Um, think about the good that you could do when you think, what possibly, what could I do with all the gun violence that we see in our community? You can do something. You could talk about this. You can bring a gun back. You can have a church, your church or your organization sponsor a transformation. 
lots of good things that you could do. It's within your power. All you have to do is care because when people help their neighbors, everybody benefits. Thanks for watching. See you again.